I just, I first want to thank um, Kevin and Father Mark and, and, and uh, Sheriff Hoffman and everybody that's here and Principal Kenna for, for having this event and for you all being here. It is truly a community sickness and it's awesome to, that we can come together as a community and fight this thing together. Um, and I just want to say also, you know, my heart goes out to the law enforcement. Oh, I'm going to get over this and then I'll move on. But and my heart goes out to the emergency responders that are out there that deal with this every single day. They put their lives at risk. As Sheriff Hoffman said, one little tiny bit of fentanyl can kill all four of us sitting here. Those emergency responders face that every day. So we need to be thankful thankful for them, all that they do. So, hi, I'm Kathy, um, and I just want to start off with saying that in Celebrate Recovery, we write our testimony so we can stay focused. Otherwise, I'll be telling you what's on sale at Food Lion and telling you how, where I want to go on vacation and stuff. So, um, if you see me reading, that's why. Um, I'm among the many moms who are one of the uh, many families who have lost their child due to um, a drug drug addiction, and drug overdose. My story today is most likely no different than what you have experienced or maybe going through right now today. I can only hope that the one thing I share today will offer you some hope or give you some strength to press on and keep pressing on. I'm originally from the Western Shore in the South Baltimore. Yes, I am a chicken necker. My husband says once a chicken necker, always a chicken necker. I can never convert. So. Um, but anyway, I moved out of Baltimore City when my son was four years old. I wanted a better life for my son and myself, and uh, so I moved to Ken Island. I met my husband, Bobby, in, in 1990, and we were married in 1992. We were a blended family with his two boys um, from his previous marriage, my son, and then we had a daughter together. Like all of our children, everybody here, my son was truly an amazing kid. He was a die-hard sports fan. He played sports in and out of school. He was very kind, very loving. Loved spending time with family, very funny. Fun-loving. He was really great at guitar. He was a great lead guitar player. And everyone who knew him loved him and wanted to be around him. And my son and I were very close. And um, this, is, this is my son, Jeff. And I brought his picture here because to show you that he it was a real child. He had a wonderful childhood. He was a great kid. And I kind of chuckled when his graduation picture was cut off on the side because I said that's when all his troubles really started. So it was kind of crazy that his picture was cut off there. Um, in eighth grade, in Stevensville Middle School, he started drinking alcohol and smoking marijuana. And if you don't get this, please hear me. Alcohol and marijuana are gateway drugs. They are gateway drugs to stronger things as Principal Kenna and Sheriff Hoffman shared. My husband and I figured, you know, when my, when my son started that he's a boy, he's exploring, you know, we just need to nip it in the bud and, and everything's going to be fine. And it was, it was, things went really good. Then while playing basketball in school, he sprained his ankle. Again, you know, the, um, the doctors put him on medication, pain meds until we can get his ankle healed. I monitored him at that time on the meds to be sure he, he took the meds okay. Um, and his foot got better and all was well. In high school, drinking and smoking marijuana came back into the picture. This time while playing football, he sprained that same ankle again pretty bad. Again, the doctor put him on pain meds and Percocets and we nursed him back to health. But this time though, I thought he's in high school, he's a little more mature, that um, I didn't have to monitor on the medicine, I gave him some guidance, told him just take it when he needed it or whatever to help him sleep. Um, little did I know that I found out later when he was in recovery that that's when he started liking the effects of the drugs. It made him feel good. It made him not think about his stresses and things that were going on around him. He didn't hurt anywhere. This is where it got started. This then led him to get pills from friends when he ran out of the medication. Um, friends that were stealing them from their parents, they were taking them from their grandparents or wherever they could get them. When that ran out, he started buying pills on the streets, which then led him to Quaaludes, Oxycontin, Xanax, 
cocaine, crack cocaine, and other drugs. Eventually, um, heroin came into the picture. We as a family fought our son's addiction with him over and over again. It consisted of inpatient and outpatient rehabs, car accidents, court costs, lockups, lawyer fees, jail time, emergency room visits, overdoses, and halfway houses. It was a very long battle that he fought, and it was horrific to watch your child go through that. Addiction is definitely a family disease. Part of the problem was he tried to stay clean on his own, and Lisa had mentioned that. Without getting a sponsor and staying consistent in recovery, the drugs kept calling his name. He always uh, considered our home as a safe home. That's what he called our home. It was the safe house. Because we kept watch over him and kept him accountable. But once he got out on his own, uh, the demons would call his name and he would again be chasing the dragon. When heroin was in the picture, he was sick, very sick. And I knew I had lost him and feared that I would never get him back before he would either die from an overdose or be mur murdered by a drug dealer. Oh, but I kept fighting. I kept fighting to control the situation and rescue my son from his self-destruction. And I wasn't giving up, no sir. Nobody could have stopped me. I was determined that the world was not gonna steal and destroy my son's life. And I would not dare, dare accept the label of codependent. Because isn't that what a mother and her parent does? We protect and sacrifice our children? Well, sure we do, but to what extent? At what point with adult children do we let go and reclaim our lives, and how? That was the million dollar, million dollar question. How do we find acceptance of watching our children become someone we don't know anymore and let them just go? Knowing the end result may be a, life, a complete life of self-destruction or death, whether that's spiritually, mentally, or physically. And I just want to say that I know each child is different, each family dynamic is different. But if you have a child that is a minor, you have control. You can get your child help. You can make them go to, to rehab. You can make them go to meetings. You can you know, help your child along the way. But when they become an adult, then you have to make some really tough decisions. So once they become an adult and you have exhausted all your resources, that's when the decisions have to be made. I was broken, very broken as a mom, and was just as sick as my son was, but in a different way. I was in total denial and obsessed with his addiction and his disease, and my life was spiraling out of control. What started off with anger and frustration turned into guilt, and it was tearing me apart. What have I done so wrong for my child to want to take this path? I'm supposed to be his protector. What did I do? Or what did I not do that I should have done? I had the case of the what ifs and the if onlys. What if I would have did this or what if I wouldn't have done that if only this and that? It was all my fault. I blamed myself for his poor choices and his sickness. My codependency was making things worse, especially on my family, because addiction is a family disease. And the old saying is very true. When mom is not happy, nobody's happy. A good friend of mine, um, Barbie Hunter, she shared her testimony at one of our Celebrate Recovery meetings. And everything I had gone through that I wasn't able to put down in words, Barbie did. And she gave me permission to share some of her words today along with mine. Um, you know, maybe this might hit home for some of you. And if not, I just thank God that it don't, and I pray it never does. I, never, I pray you never have these experiences, but please take notes because no family is exempt. You've heard that today. So as a mom with a child or a loved one struggling with addiction, whether alcohol or drugs, I know what it's like to worry yourself sick, to cry yourself to sleep, to stare at baby pictures and reminisce, to check on them while they're asleep to make sure they're still breathing, to be confused all the time, to see their potential, to know what they're throwing away, but they just can't see it. To want their recovery more than they do, doing research on rehabs and other outlets for recovery. 
I know what it's like to miss someone who's standing right in front of you, to become a part-time detective, to snoop through drawers, through their bags, through their clothes, through text messages. You know you're going to find something, and you look until you do, just so you feel less crazy. So you can say to yourself, I'm not paranoid. This is really happening. I know what it's like to be really angry. Between the sadness, there's a lot of anger. To feel guilty for being so mad, even when knowing all you know about addiction being a sickness. To convince yourself that anger is justified. This is not the life I dreamed of for me and my child. I know the difference between enabling and empowering, and there's a fine line between the two, and the difference can mean life or death. And what it's like to feel the weight of each day on your shoulders trying to balance the two. I know what it's like to feel shame and feel responsible for the actions of my struggling child. To have my self-esteem blown away and constantly question myself about where did I go wrong. I know to watch out for pinhole pupils and subtle changes in behavior, to listen to them talk and make excuses and pile on lie after lie, and pretend to believe them because you're just too mentally exhausted for an argument when they know you're lying, they're lying right straight to your face. I know what it's like to feel helpless, powerless, and have sleepless nights. I know what it's like to try to protect and family secrets, avoiding friends and family events, and fear of being judged or people looking down on you on your child or us as parents, always trying to cover up reality of what was really happening and keep smiling through all the heartache and worry and fear. I know what it's like to painfully and helplessly watch someone you love slowly destroy himself and not know what else to do to try to get him to stop and see his worth. He is worth so much more. I have continuous, to have continuous anxiety when the phone rings or someone knocks on the door thinking, it's that dreaded phone call or law enforcement bringing us dreadful news. I know what it's like to be completely exhausted mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, but would not give up. I know what it's like to feel stigmatized, to be the mother of an addict, to be handled with kid gloves because no one outside of your toxic bubble knows what to say to help. I know what it's like to almost lose my marriage and have my family. have my family fall apart because of my addiction, my obsession, obsession to my son's addiction, to lose sight of reality and lose myself in the process. To see your child and know he loves you so much and is hurting you, but he can't stop because the disease controls him. I have been through enough to know that things don't change for the worse overnight. They can change in a millisecond in a blink of an eye, as quick as it takes to take to, for two people to make a $10 exchange. To watch your child struggle after recovery when they're clean and deal with all the consequences of the aftermath. Struggle with so much shame and guilt and low self-esteem, always fearing being judged because of their past. Being denied employment, denied joining the military, or buying a car or renting an apartment because of their past record and bad credit. Having a loved one with a drug addiction or alcohol addiction is seriously like being held hostage. You're controlled by fear, desperately trying to hold on to hope, but motivated by resentment and frustration. I was in bondage to fear and anxiety and was breaking down mentally and emotionally and put on anxiety medication to help with my nerves. Everything I tried to save my son from was now happening. I had exhausted all of my resources and I had nothing left. At this point, both of our lives had become unmanageable and I hit my rock bottom. During this time, my husband and I ran into a friend at Holly's restaurant, my good friend Tom Bowen. Tom had walked the opioid addiction journey and had been clean for 25 plus years and continues to still help those struggling with addiction and family members um, that have loved ones struggling with addiction. Tom talked to us and explained how addiction works and how we were powerless to fix the situation or control our son's choices. Only he could make the choice to get help. It was out of my control and I had to stop playing God. I needed to let my son go and let him hit rock bottom and pray that he, delivered, he was delivered from his sickness. 
At this point, I knew he was right, and I, and, but fear gripped me, just even thinking about detaching and how it was, how it was all going to end. But I soon accepted the reality that holding on was no longer an option. No matter how much I wanted my son's sobriety, he was the one that had to choose it for himself. I cannot fix someone that does not want to be fixed. It was time I started my own recovery and our family's recovery. There were a few things I had to learn through all this. I had to learn that the very first step in taking your control back is to stop making emotional decisions and start making strategic, logical decisions. I learned that continuous enabling and rescue was contributing to his addiction. I was harming him more than helping him. You see, we bring them home and we do it for them. It's our human nature, but it's more harmful than helpful. Breaking, I had to break, learn to break free from denial and stay in reality. I had to learn about boundaries and use them against manipulation and take and blame, but also honor others' boundaries. I had to learn how to guard my heart and how to continue to love, but detach in love and how important, when, how important that was for my recovery as a parent. I also had to start, start applying tough love, which was hard, but it was necessary. I had to be a parent first and not my child's friend. They have enough friends. We are the parents. We are the authority. We are their guide in life and their disciplinary. We are not their friend until they are all grown up and out of the house. And I had to learn that, that husbands and wives need to talk things over and come in agreement with decisions and um, making decisions and plans. Otherwise, a house divided cannot stand. Do not be, I had to learn not to be afraid to invade my child's privacy. It was my home. If I thought things were wrong in my home, that's my home. I'm going to check your room. I'm going to check your closet. I'm going to check your clothes. I'm going to check your text messages. You're in my home. That's part of the tough love. And lastly, I learned that reaching out for help is not a weakness. It is courageous. I kept attending um, recovery meetings and going to church and staying connected to people who would hold me accountable for thinking clearly and staying healthy. My husband Bobby and I, my daughter Brittany, prayed nonstop for my son when he was out there. I kept a hold of serenity prayer, which we said earlier at the start of the meeting. It was my saving grace. Every day, sometimes all day, I prayed it. I prayed, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Give me the courage, Lord, to change the things I can, and grant me the wisdom to know the difference. I would say it many, many times throughout the day and night, and it helped me stay focused um, through my days. Well, it took a couple years, um, but prayers were answered. My son did hit rock bottom. He admitted how sick he was, and this time he put himself in rehab, and he got himself well. It wasn't easy when he got out, but this time I knew he really wanted it. He didn't want to do it for us. He wanted to do it for himself. Soon the temptations got easier to ward off, and he was gaining his life back. And we were so proud of him for not giving up and continuing to fight off the demons and work so hard to regain his life. We had our son back and my daughter had her hero back. And it was amazing. Two years later, unfortunately on November 7th, the morning of November 8th, temptation roared its ugly head again. And my son relapsed. This time, the heroin fentanyl took his life. And his poor girlfriend, soon to be fiance, found him lifeless around 2 a.m. in the morning. She had to call the ambulance and then call me and my husband. I don't think I need to tell you the rest of the story. It was a severe blow of trauma for all of us. Unfortunately, we entered into a club that we never wanted to be part of, but there we were. If it wasn't for the tools my husband and I had gained and learned over the past few years in Celebrate Recovery, work in the 12 steps for my recovery as a loved one with a, with a 
um, having a loved one with addiction and with the faith and the hope that we had in Jesus Christ and the support from people, from the angels that God surrounded us with, we wouldn't have made it through. It wasn't until I stopped blaming that I started healing, blaming myself, blaming everyone else for my son's poor choices. It was like holding on to that traumatic experience and carrying it with you like a giant weighted backpack. Feelings are emotions that we can have, we just can't let them have us. Through my grief, I learned from attending Grief Share Program, Celebrate Recovery in Church, that I too needed to take one step at a time, and I needed to keep it simple. So I choose one word that I could work on through the entire year, and I actually still work on it six years later. That one word is acceptance. There were and still are many things that are out of my control that I need to just accept and move on with the things that I can control. I and we miss our son terrible. He was awesome. But I look forward to that glorious day when I'm reunited with him in heaven to see him healthier and happier than he could have ever been here on earth. His demons can't catch him no more. I'm not going to pretend it's easy. We all have our, our not-so-good days that will probably never go away, but they get farther apart. I learned that it's okay to cry. It's important and healthy to give ourselves permission to cry and mourn, but we just can't stay there. While I'm here on earth, I need to continue to move on in life and take care of the other precious gifts God has given me. My husband, my daughter, good friends, uh, opportunities for ministry to help others through my personal experiences. As you can probably guess from my story, I'm a Christian with deep faith. It's what got me through. My husband, Bobby, is one of the pastors at Ken Allen United Methodist Church. And he had, he had officiated over 25 overdose funerals. That's not counting how many other pastors and, and, and fathers have, have um, funerals have done. I watched him console many broken and hurting families. And we both helped families any way we could. It wasn't easy for him or any of us as we struggled through our loss. But with the Lord's help and staying connected with our support team, our resources, we continue to help where and when we can. Our mess became our message. In closing, um, I thank you for allowing me to share. But I do want to say it doesn't matter what type of addiction you're struggling with. An addiction is an addiction, but there's help. Whether you're a parent, a grandparent, a sibling, or a friend, there are people right in this room today that are here to help you. They took their time out to be here to help you because we are a community of family. There's a Celebrate Recovery trailer out there with a mock team bedroom that we have our Celebrate Recovery team here that are willing to walk you through the bedroom and show you and give you ideas of what to look for and talk to you. There are people who have been through, just as Kevin, have been through recovery and they can share their stories with you. They will give you contact numbers to contact them if you need to, if you need to talk. Reach out to these people, take advantage of this time, spread the word with other people that you know are hurting, because there's a lot of hurting people out there that aren't in this room today. But I thank you for being here. Truly thank you, and I'm sorry if you're going through any of this that I'm sharing today. And I just want to say that, you know, I didn't share this story about my son to, to, degr to disgrace my son. His goal when he recovered and he was healthy for those two years, he helped other people. And I know he would want us to be here today and sharing his story to offer hope and a bit of strength to just one person. Thank you for allowing me to share.